Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Eric Rolinson. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, next generation data science workflows using Ray. Um, or you and Ray in the cloud. Uh, yes, you. So um, the basic structure of the talk, um, I'll start by with a very high level uh, description of Ray, um, and then I'm going to try to put Ray and um, the demo stack you're going to see uh, in context. Um, then I talk about uh, a self-service Ray architecture that uh, we've been working with, um, with my group. And I will then demo that in action. And um, after I've done the demo, I will then go back and I will defend the title of this talk, um, Why is it Next Generation? Um, and talk about some of the uh, community collaborations that help us along the way, and then talk a little about road mapping. Um, so uh, let's talk about Ray's ecosystem niche. Um, actually, show, show of hands, uh, how many people have actually worked with Ray in the audience? Okay, a few, good. Um, and uh, the rest of you have justified all the context I'm about to deliver, so uh, thank you. So if you consider like, you know, older tools like uh, Open NPI, uh, one end of the spectrum, you have like extremely fine-grained control of how you develop parallelism, but you have, very few abstractions to help you along the way. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have like more modern tools like Spark. Um, you technically have less control over certain things, but you also have extremely powerful abstractions uh, to work with. Um, so Ray was designed to sit in between these two, but as you can see, probably closer to Spark. Um, it definitely also has powerful abstractions, but um, you can actually access um, <coughs> compute at a slightly lower level and a more flexible level um, when you need that. Um, so how does Ray uh, work as a compute model? Um, it has two kinds of compute. There's tasks, which are things like functions that execute and then finish and return some kind of result. And then it also has actors, which are um, like, you know, the analog of like services or microservices and something like Kubernetes. Um, and so, you can take any Python function um, and turn it into a task by using the uh, ray.remote.decorator, as you see above. And similarly, the same decorator will take any class and can turn it into uh, a Ray actor. So uh, the uh, programming um, user experience is actually quite nice. Um, <clears throat> so it's Compute model is a sort of compute dependency directed acyclic graph, um, like here. Uh, on the uh, left, you can see that uh, I've, not me really, the author of the blog I stole this from, um, is creating a, um, a tree of computations. You could say it's the mo world's most over-engineered um, edition of eight integers you might ever see, but um, it's great for illustrating the concepts. You can see here that um, the first four of these uh, statements are setting up additions um, of some pairs of integers and the dot remote uh, method there is a thing you get from those decorators I just showed you. So it basically allows you to tell the Ray cluster, hey, I'd like you to add some integers. Um, and then of course, um, if you look at these first statements here, um, anybody who's worked with Spark will find this familiar. Um, these are declarative computations. Um, up to this point, um, Ray has not done any work for you at all. You're just basically telling it here's some work I'd like you to do, and here's the structure of it and the dependencies. Um, and at the very end, if you issue this .git command, um, it actually goes back and says, okay, now you want a result, I'm gonna unwind all these computations you've asked me to do and actually compute them um, and give you what you want. So again, like Spark, um, it has a lazy execution model. Um, so Ray's core data, mo data model is implemented with the uh, Plasma object store. Um, like Python, it is basically typeless and schemaless. It's just sort of objects. Um, it uses a local first strategy, so um, it only pulls data from outside of a worker node if it needs to, and it always tries to do read and write local to worker nodes. Um, the Plasma Object Store began its life um, in Ray, but has since been actually adopted by Apache Arrow. So you can use Plasma um, via Arrow if you ever have a need to. 
Um, similarly, race scheduling model is also local first. Um, it tries to use a local worker scheduler um, to do tasking whenever it can and only like invokes the global cluster scheduler when necessary. And so um, this local first strategy helps things uh, you know, perform as well as possible over the cluster. Um, it comes with a bunch of great native libraries. Uh, it comes with a, a hyper tuning, hyper parameter tuning library, um, a reinforcement learning library, and then a sort of generic stochastic uh, gradient descent library. Um, it also allows a scalable and programmable uh, serving of services, um, so called Ray Serve. And then relatively new um, is Ray data sets, which is actually native data frames for Ray. And so this is a great development because again, it sort of puts it on closer to equal footing with like, you know, data frames from something like uh, Spark or Pandas. Um, there are tons and tons of community integrations, all the popular machine learning libraries and a whole lot more. Um, already have integrations available to you. Um, this link at the bottom shows you the complete community list of those. Um, it's dozens at this point. Um, so one of the things about this is, um, of course, all these things are in Python. And so as data scientists or people in that ecosystem, we're already working with most of these tools via Jupyter, um, at least part of the time. And when you take Ray and Jupyter, there's the promise of uh, literate and interactive Ray programming uh, via Jupyter's literate programming environment. Um, and furthermore, they can both, Jupyter and Ray can operate uh, in the cloud. And of course, uh, by cloud today, we mean uh, Kubernetes and uh, my demo will actually be running uh, on OpenShift. Um, so Ray is cloud native. Um, you create Ray clusters using a Ray cluster custom resource, which you submit to the Ray operator, which then says, oh, he wants a cluster and uses the information you provided um, about like the sizing and other basic cluster behaviors. Um, <clears throat> so it gives you like a Ray head node and some worker nodes um, and will also automatically scale them up and down for you um, based on what it's seeing on the workload of your worker nodes. And once you have this, you can connect to it from a client. Um, and again, today, the client I will be focusing on is Jupyter, but I want to stress that uh, it doesn't have to be that. It can be other Python files. It can be from an actual command line exterior to the cluster. So uh, client in, involves a whole lot of you know, modalities and use cases there. Um, so again, I mentioned Jupyter. Um, today, I'll be getting my Jupyter um, from a uh, meta operator uh, called Open Data Hub. Um, so what about Open Data Hub? Well, um, <clears throat> it's an open source downstream of Kubeflow. Um, and as such, it serves as a kind of reference platform um, for doing uh, ML workload deployments in the cloud. It shows how you can deploy tools, basically how to wire them up together. Um, I know from previous talks, uh, many of you all quite familiar with how to do this stuff, but uh, anyway, provides a nice easy way to uh, pre-provision some basic uh, reference tooling. Um, it's federated, which means you can take a lot of these tools, pick and choose what you want. Um, and of course, furthermore, because it's all sitting on a kube cluster, it's very easy to inject other kinds of tooling if you would like to deploy that. In fact, that's how really we, we got the integration with Ray. Um, and you know, along, along one axis, um, the tooling that comes with ODH, um, you know, like Kubeflow, covers pretty much the spectrum of basic tasks in a uh, data science project uh, in the cloud. And along the other axis, um, it also you know, covers the different kinds of persona all the way from like, you know, business stakeholders to data engineering, actual data science. ML engineers all the way through, you know, to IT ops. I guess we call it ML ops these days. Um, so I'll begin talking about like the architecture. Um, the latest architecture we've been using is actually even simpler than some of the older ones. Um, we just created a sort of experimental SDK 
it has a function, a Python function called race dark cluster. Um, and so suppose you're in Jupyter and you have this function uh, in your Jupyter environment, you can simply say, hey, I'd like you to start me a ray cluster. And what it will do is create one of these ray cluster custom resources out on your namespace for you. Um, and as long as you have the uh, ray operator running in your uh, namespace to pick up on that, it'll say, oh, he's got, he'd like a new ray cluster, and it will spin up these clusters um, for you. And once it's there, you can, um, in the comfort of your own Jupyter environment, um, you know, connect to the ray head node and do some work. Um, and again, I think, you know, I mentioned getting Jupyter, in my case, from ODH, but <clears throat> you can see that it doesn't actually matter as long as you have like a container that's like running Jupyter Lab or something similar for you and you have the right function um, and you have the ray operator installed, you can do this yourself. Um, so one thing, one thing with these things is, of course, we had to ask ourselves, well, if I spin up a ray cluster just for my own personal use and then like the thing goes down, like my Jupyter pod crashes or I leave and I just close down the environment. It's like, I'd like the cluster to go away. And so one trick we figured out is to use the uh, owner references um, YAML to say, hey, you know, it's like, I would like, <clears throat> I would actually like my Jupyter pod that created this to have ownership over the cluster CR. And so like if I leave and I forget to shut down my ray cluster, um, the Jupyter pod goes away, and then the platform itself says, oh, he would also like to remove this uh, CR for me, and then the operator notices that's gone and shuts down everything. So it's quite elegant and makes proper use of the control plane. Um, and so now, having described that, I'm going to uh, do a live demo um, of this in action. Um, and before I do, I just want to Quick shout out to uh, my teammate, Michael Clifford. Uh, he took all my original prototypes in his space and has like totally modernized them and gotten them working with Ray 2 and has just done a ton of work. And uh, he was unable to be here today to help me present, but um, raise a glass to Michael. So um, I will now bring up my prefab Jupyter environment. Um, and we'll begin just with uh, basic stuff, doing imports. You can see we're uh, importing a bunch of Ray tooling that comes with. Um, and here's our uh, start Ray cluster. And I'm gonna give it a name. And so this is cool, it's idempotent. So if I ask for the same cluster more than once and it's already running, it's just gonna give me the same one, um, which is a nice feature. This also actually wanted us because if you're trying to use this in a pipeline, you can actually ask for the same ray cluster over and over again across different steps of the pipeline if you like. Um, and so it said it succeeded. It also helpfully printed out for me a link to the ray dashboard that it set up. So I'll come back to that later. But uh, like Spark, ray has a dashboard and um, we can easily stand it up in the cluster just like everything else. Um, so now that I have that, I can actually uh, initialize my connection to the cluster. Ray is already connected. Oh. I bet I know what I didn't do. Sorry about that. See, idempotent, good for me. Um, hopefully, there we go. So, um, Ray will also provide you the uh, in version and basic information. We're on Ray 2 as of uh, last week, so very exciting. Again, thank you, Michael. Um, and so now we're gonna, just gonna do um, a basic PyTorch um, workflow. Um, and I'll be kind of blowing through a lot of this stuff, um, but we're gonna set up some uh, basic data sets, uh, the Oxford uh, pet data set, um, which is a relatively small thing. There's only 3,600 things in it. Um, I'm also sort of fixing my, my Jupyter environment. I just want to use CPUs because I'm actually giving all of my 
four GPUs to the right cluster, which we'll see in a second. Um, and then I'm gonna set up a train and test and just take a look at an image. Some kind of cat with long ears. Um, so this pet data is uh, courtesy of the uh, Community Data License Agreement via the Linux Foundation. I'll just do a brief plug for this. The uh, CDLA is a great data license. It makes it really easy for people like me to give up give talks in the space without having to worry about uh, commercial restrictions. So um, uh, when you're out in the world, um, favor CDLA permissive licensed uh, data sets just like you favor, you know, things like open source licensing. Um, so now we're gonna create um, an extremely low budget uh, recognition net, which can finish in the time that I have to give this talk. Um, and so here's a basic convolutional net and I'm gonna give it a data set factory. Um, you can see here I'm using, I'm actually using the new Ray data frames for this, so this is nice. Um, and it's going kind of slow, oh there it goes. Um, so we can say, Here's a train and validation set. So we're gonna split. Um, this is actually kind of fun. If you see the shuffle and stuff, this, again, being, being kind of an analog of things like Hadoop or uh, Spark data frames, um, you can see some of the things here is doing shuffles. Um, and this thing to do um, a, a second phase here, I had to reduce. Um, so again, you're getting a lot of sort of familiar functionality with these uh, data frame libraries. Excellent, so now we're gonna set up uh, just basic function closures to do training and validation. Um, and I guess the one, one thing I wanna talk about here is this is all standard. At this point, this is basically very standard like PyTorch kind of stuff. So it doesn't take a lot of any weirdness to like make this work with Ray. You just um, give it, uh, you can create a torch trainer for this. Um, so we're gonna do hyperparameter tuning. So I'm gonna define myself a short search space. The search space has only four tasks um, to go with my four GPUs. Um, and I'm gonna go kick that off. Um, so at this point, um, <clears throat> this thing is talking now to my array cluster and sending off a bunch of hyper tuning parameter tasks to complete. Um, it's extremely chatty. Um, in the logs, but you can see things like, um, you know, what's pending and what's running. It starts off, it's just got one thing running and uh, Ray is waiting to see, you know, oh look, it's asking me to do a bunch of stuff. So now it's like spinning up worker nodes. Um, so like if I go back to uh, my cluster and look for Ray nodes, we can see that uh, here's my KubeCon 2022. Um, maybe I can try to make that slightly larger. That doesn't actually look more readable. Um, forget that. But anyway, it's got, it's actually spun up four now. It's got a worker and three nodes. Um, and I can also take a look at the dashboard view of things. Um, and you can see that it's actually, it doesn't just have nodes here, it actually has tasks and um, it also has like the actions that are going on. Um, so if I sort by CPU, I can bring a lot of these to the top. Um, one thing you might notice is it doesn't just give me CPU usage. Um, the green is over there is a GPU usage. You can see that it's not making fantastic use of GPUs. So I could maybe make use of the uh, run AI tooling we saw earlier to uh, see what's going on there. Um, but it is using them, which is very cool. And we'll look at how this is going. One thing on my list is to figure out how to make this log output shorter. Uh, but you can see now it's actually gone and run. It's actually one left. Most of them have actually finished running. So I think we're close to being all the way done. Maybe. This is supposed to run in about 90 seconds, but the demo gods are not smiling. Um, 
No, just briefly, I don't know. I have time. We could ask a question if anybody has a question while I'm waiting for this to complete. Uh, it's probably almost time. Ah, uh, there it goes. See, it took a whole extra minute for me. Um, so anyway, it's done this, um, and we can now take the results back from our hyperparameter tuning and um, <coughs> see what we got. So there's our best parameters. Um, Ray likes to emit various warning messages, which are slightly distracting, but uh, we can also plot what looks like on our training and uh, eval set. And we can see that it's not great. It's about what you'd expect um, with the world's most low budget convolutional net. Um, but there's the model we've read in. Um, and then we can then take a look at a label and a prediction. And um, in this case, it actually got it right, which is not super common because it is not a super smart net in 90 seconds. Um, then we can also do some basic things, do the little data science here. So our accuracy is 9%. Um, and just randomly guessing, we would have got almost 7%. Um, thank you, Cohen's Kappa. So I was basically showing that it's doing barely better than chance, but not nothing. Um, so we did learn something. Um, and we can take a look at our corresponding confusion matrix. And of course, you really like to see this all in the diagonal. Uh, if you stand back and squint, it's a little bit of diagonal there. Um, and here we can look at our cluster name. So at this point, you can stop the Ray cluster. Um, I'm not going to stop it because I'm actually going to run. Um, I'm actually going to run a Ray serve. So now we have a model. We'd like to serve it. And Ray serve can do that for us. And I'm going to quick restart my kernel so I don't have that problem again. Um, and again, we just uh, import some basic torch and ray code. Um, and we can start our cluster, which again is idempotent. So hopefully we'll give me the thing. And we can set up uh, an image model class. Um, the at serve is another decorator I talked about. It's like a more specialized ray decorator for creating like model serving and stuff like that. Um, and I can now connect, and it worked. Um, here's a little bit of kludginess to find the actual IP address. I want an IP address of the head node. And so like, we used to have this fun procedure where we just uh, played roulette until we got the right one. But, um, so we started a server. And it gave us, and it actually gives you a server control object, which we don't really need at this point. Um, we can tell it, okay, I'm going to deploy the model. Um, it knows to deploy it into this uh, cluster. Um, and we can ask, will it work? Um, so we're going to just take a look at this cat um, and see if we can get a prediction. I don't even care if it's right. I'm just trying to show you that the workflow works. Um, and sure enough, it comes back at the prediction. So you can see here, we're just basically got a REST interface now uh, with not very much code, which is super easy to deploy. It's so easy, you can even do it inside of the notebook. Um, and it also, we created a, an external route so people can obviously hit it from outside the cluster. Um, got the same results, so that's good. Um, so that's a data science workflow of using Jupyter. And again, I stress you can do this without Jupyter, but um, uh, in action with Ray. And we can go back to finish the talk. So I just showed you all the stuff. So what, what, why do I claim that this is like next generation? What is it like? What's new here? Um, I guess. One thing that's kind of new is that Ray is truly cloud native. It was like, you know, invented and built and engineered like, you know, in a world that had Kubernetes. Um, whereas like, you know, just as contrast, you know, Spark obviously began its life before any of these cluster platforms existed. Um, and you can, if you ever deployed them, and you know, it kind of sometimes shows. Um, so having something that's truly engineered cloud native, I think makes a real difference in terms of like how it works to deploy this stuff. Um, 
the operator comes with. Um, again, I guess in contrast with Spark, you know, Spark has no official community operator. There's a couple of third-party operators. Um, and uh, with Ray, it's part of the code. It's like entry. Um, I guess the other thing you saw here is that I got myself my own cluster. So like, you know, it gives you an easy way to do self-service Ray. So your data scientists or your, you know, machine learning engineers, anybody who like, can use parallelism when they're working with this stuff can just get their own Ray cluster, you know, on demand and kind of turn, you know, kill them on demand. Um, and I think the biggest one, which I hope you saw through the demo, was that um, Ray allows, like, all kinds of tooling, basically every tool of consequence in the Python machine learning ecosystem um, already talks to Ray. And it, not just that, but it can all talk to it at once. And so it's like you can mix and match all these tools right in the same code base and all use the same Ray cluster. Um, so it's a unified scaling engine for data science. Um, and uh, what that also means is, um, especially from like a ML ops perspective, it's a simplified scaling process. You can stand these things up and um, you know, your, your people can get parallelizable scale out um, just with a single cluster even um, with all the tools mixed together. Um, so there were some community communities um, along the way that really helped us. Um, I did the original public deployment of my prototypes using the Massachusetts Open Cloud. Um, and uh, closely in partnership with that, I did all the specification for how to deploy it on the cluster using Operate First, uh, which is a community that's basically trying to extend the idea of writing software in the open to also actually operating software and services fully in the open. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, one thing I mean is that, like, when I wanted to deploy this and for the public, it was actually a pull request. And you could, you guys could go out today and see that pull request. Um, the actual cluster no longer exists, but it exists for the record. Um, so this is, this, by the way, is all using Argo. Um, um, <clears throat> we've done a lot of collaboration um, with IBM Research. Um, they have a project called CodeFlare which is also doing, um, using a lot of the same design principles for Ray in the cloud. Um, they're very much focused on PyTorch applications and specifically for training uh, large scale deep learning nets. Um, and so like they're, they're focused on that use case, uh, but we're doing a lot of um, collaboration. Um, as I showed you, you can do a lot of small scale stuff too. Um, so it doesn't just have to be that. And um, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, they gave a great talk at the uh, Ray Summit. Um, and uh, you can go take a look at that. And I think, you know, another other things we're looking at with the IBM is uh, Ray plus a cluster level auto scaling. So not just scaling the pods, but actually scaling the size of the cluster using auto scalers, so bringing in extra whole extra compute nodes, like if you're on like, you know, AWS or a Google Cloud. Um, so in this, in this mode, you array client um, submits a job object, like into a job queue. Um, and the job queue actually talks to a cluster level auto scaler, says, hey, this job coming in the queue, they're gonna want this much resources. If the cluster isn't already big enough, it can actually invoke the you know auto auto scaling ability of Kubernetes and start bringing in actual more compute nodes, more GPUs, um, and when the job is done, it can also spin the cluster back down. So it's actually a nice you know um, cluster level auto scaling experience. And of course, once it once it has the resources it needs, it'll take the job off the queue and it can run um, the cluster. So roadmaps, um, stuff in green is stuff that's actually been completed. Um, we, like I said, just got Ray 2.0 working, so we're excited about that. We have our Ray images building using Project Thoth, which is a um, AI supported uh, build system, which uh, can actually look at things like uh, what kind of target hardware you're using and also um, examine uh, supply chain and dependencies. Um, we talked some other great talks earlier about that issue. Um, so Thoth is a kind of cool thing for like actually maintaining images. Um, 
we actually just recently got the formal integration of what I just showed you um, upstream um, with the open data hub code base. Um, things that are in progress, um, we're redeploying Ray on the Mass Open Cloud and we're also sort of transitioning from the old Mass Open to what's now being called the New England Research Cloud, um, NERC. So NERC is sort of like the descendant of Mass Open. Um, and that's actually being done by some uh, student teams at Boston University, so we're kind of cool. Um, and uh, we're integrating uh, these ideas with the um, Kubeflow Notebook Controller. And um, some stuff that we haven't quite got to yet is uh, an actual community operator in the uh, OpenShift operator catalog. And also um, we're part of the way through uh, exploring like Ray on uh, edge deployments. So that's my talk. Uh, thanks a lot for attending. Brilliant. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, we don't have time for any questions from this one, but Eric, I'm guessing you're around this week and maybe a bit later. Yeah, I, I'm here all week, so um, definitely okay. reach out to me. Yeah, so go find Eric afterwards if you have questions. Um,